Feel the power. Welcome to a Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Welcome to the ever-increasing word feast right here on Facebook or YouTube, whichever social media platform you're watching from today. Abel Damina is my name. There is a mandate of God on my life to reintroduce Jesus to this generation, equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. That's what this broadcast is all about today. So get ready to unlearn so you can relearn the truths concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me also advise you in the course of teaching, certain questions may arise. Just be patient, pay attention, and listen carefully because scriptures will interpret scriptures as you patiently follow the teaching of God's word. You know, the Bible tells us that the time shall come when people shall not endure sound doctrine. So sound doctrine is to be endured. So endure. You know, the word of God also tells us that with meekness, you receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul with meekness. So there's a meekness required and there's endurance required where sound doctrine is concerned. So as the teaching of God's word begins to come, get your notebook, get your pen, follow the teachings. Most of my teachings are in a series because we take time to holistically look at subject matters in the light of Jesus Christ. Let me encourage those of you that are connecting for the first time today, get ready to keep following. We are right here on Facebook and YouTube every day. We're here at 12 noon, GMT plus one. We're here at 6 p.m. We're here at 10 p.m. Also, we are here every day at 10 a.m. GMT plus one, every day. You don't want to miss any of them because all of these times that I've mentioned, they are designed to equip you with sound knowledge of Jesus Christ. In the midst of a world of uncertainties, with all kinds of messages of fear going all over, you need to stock up, you need to feed yourself with the truth of the gospel so you're rooted and grounded and not moved to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Two more things to introduce to you today. If you are in a city where there is no church, Christ-centered church, where they teach the message of Christ, it is not good for you to be in isolation. The Bible says God has set the solitary in families. God wants you to be a part of a local assembly, a gathering of believers where you can pray together, learn the word of God together, and effectively serve one another and go out to the world and bring the gospel of Christ. If you want to join any of our campuses around the world today, or you want to start one in your own locality and be the lighthouse in that community, all you need to do is shoot me a mail today telling me about your desire to either be a part of a campus or to start one with your location and your phone number. We will get in touch with you and help you either begin one or identify with an existing one. The last thing is I have a lot of books, like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you, answer your questions, and bring you clarity of explanation of the Word of God. And if you want to order for any or all of the books today, all you need to do again is shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. I'm excited, very excited. Invite a friend, tag somebody, create a watch party, but today is going to be a powerful time of teaching you the word of his grace. Fasten your seatbelts as I take you on a gospel adventure into a service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. So we've been dealing with the subject of soteria, salvation. And uh, we've come quite some weeks. And yesterday we began to share some very, you know, thought-provoking things as it has to do with the subject of salvation. We talked about the fact that salvation is so major in the scriptures that it runs through the entire thread of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The holy scriptures, which refers to the Old Testament books, are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That the scriptures have one assignment, to bring a man to a place of wisdom in salvation. Able to make thee wise. And this salvation becomes yours through faith 
which is in Christ Jesus. And yesterday we began to see that from, uh, you know, the encounter of Brother Peter, when God appeared, you know, gave him a vision, and in that vision, God was dealing with a dichotomy between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he said to Peter, rise up, kill, and eat. And Peter said, I cannot kill unclean. And God said, what I have clean, you shall not call unclean. And then we saw that Peter went to Cornelius' house and preached the gospel in Cornelius' house, and the Gentiles opened up to the gospel. And because they opened up and received the gospel, the Holy Ghost came on them. And then the church in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, began to ask questions as to why Brother Peter will take the gospel to the Gentiles. Why will he do such a thing? Because as far as they're concerned, the gospel was strictly and specifically for the Jews. That's why we established yesterday that until you understand the subject of salvation, there are things that can make you doubt salvation. There are things that could trouble you and unsettle your conviction concerning this great subject. And we began to see that the church in Acts of the Apostles 11, when they confronted Brother Peter for taking the gospel to the house of Cornelius, Brother Peter said to them, who was I to stand on the way of God? Instead of giving them a doctrinal explanation as to why the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost, instead of giving them that doctrinal explanation he himself didn't have, the best he could just do was to say it was God who did it. So it appeared to them like it was a once-off. Something just happened miraculously to the Gentiles. They never saw that the Gentiles were part of the salvation plan of God. And because they never did to respect Peter's vision, because Peter was a man of integrity, the story he narrated to them sufficed for that moment. So they cooled off and they allowed the matter to, to you know, stay there. After a while, the matter came up again as to the subject of when does a man really get saved? When does a man really get saved? That's very important. So we were there yesterday and then we got to that point. Let's proceed from where we stopped yesterday. The book of Acts chapter 15 verse number 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. There was strong argument, very rough. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. About this question. The word question is a Greek word zitima, which means debate, hot argument. That's the meaning in Greek, hot argument. It was such a rough debate, you know, and uh, yesterday we began to say there's nothing wrong in having to debate and defend the gospel. I have realized that many legalists and many religious people, when it comes to debate, they are not logical. They are not logical. They just want to intimidate. They just want to shout. They just want to scream and just say, hey, hey, touch not my anointed. Hey, you know, how can you say such a thing? Oh, how can you talk about our daddy in the Lord like that? It's not a matter of daddy in the Lord or mommy in the Lord or brother in the Lord. It's a matter of scripture. When the issues of scripture comes on, keep sentiments aside. Let's stay with the scriptures. Because the scriptures is the boundary of Christian learning and Christian knowledge. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That does calia, teaching or explanation concerning reproof, which is evidence. The scriptures form the evidence for Christian practice, for Christian living, for Christian life, for Christian belief. The scripture forms the evidence, not experience, not one daddy in the Lord somewhere, not one mommy in the Lord somewhere, what the scripture has to say because the scripture is superior to anybody else. It is our, our book of evidence and reference where the subject of salvation is concerned. It says, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The scriptures, not what I think, not what I feel, not what daddy, my daddy in the Lord said. What does the word say? What does the word say? And I've discovered, you know, um, the Pentecostals, which I belong to, the Pentecostals, that's their weakness. They just argue blindly without any scripture or backing. And they conclude, well, touch not my anointed. Don't talk against a man of God like that. Judgment is going to come from where? If the man of God is speaking gibberish, you have a right to challenge and confront him and put him right. Nobody has monopoly of knowledge. We learn from anybody and anybody who is saying something that is sensible. Nobody has a monopoly of knowledge. I learn from everybody. And I learn from anyone who has something to offer. 
that is in agreement with the scriptures. If you're with me, say, I hear you. All right, so they began to argue. Zitima, it talks about hot debate. They went to confront the question, the issue of debate. And we saw a number of scriptures that shows that brother Paul always debated concerning defending the faith. Yesterday we also talked about the Calvinists, or they call them the Reformed theologians, who always make people doubt their salvation. They talk about progressive sanctification. You know, and they forget that sanctification is a person. Jesus is made unto us sanctification. Once Christ comes on your inside, you are sanctified. But he that sanctified, and they that are sanctified. Not they that will be sanctified. They that are sanctified in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. And bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Next verse. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified, not a progressive thing, sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Why is he not ashamed? Because they are sanctified. He has sanctified them. And somebody said, but the book of John says, sanctify them by their truth. Thy word is truth. John was before Jesus rose from the dead. He was before he rose from the dead. So before he rose from the dead, it is what he said that covered them. But after he rose from the dead, his sacrificial work became our sanctification. If it's clear, see, I hear you. All right, so um, the reformed theologians always say, well, you know, your salvation is in progression. Sanctification is progressive. Holiness is progressive. And what they fail to realize is that Christ is our salvation is our sanctification, is our holiness. I didn't hear a powerful amen. And Soteria season, Soteria season 4 took care of all of that. Over 35 hours of teaching on the subject of, of salvation as it covers that area where, you know, the, the, the reformed theologians and their arguments are doctrinally taken care of. They say before you're sanctified, you have to pray all the time. You have to evangelize all the time. You, you have to do, 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 do. They don't believe that salvation is complete in Christ. They believe that your salvation is incomplete until you contribute something to the work of salvation. But any salvation that you are going to complete is nobody's salvation that comes from Christ. If salvation comes from Christ, it is a complete work. Somebody shout hallelujah. So we're dealing with how are people saved and what does it mean to be saved. And that's why when we study this subject, we deal with things like epignosis, accurate knowledge. Look at Acts chapter 15 verse 3 now. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And we established that conversion has to do with mindset. It has to do with a change of belief, not a change of behavior. You know, a change of focus. All right? A change of mind or to believe the gospel. So in Acts 15 verse 4 now, let's proceed. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. Next verse. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Satin of the sect. If your Bible was mine, I will underline sect. Satin of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. These were believers, but they had a problem with their belief system. Saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. Let me ask you a very simple question. What happened in Acts 15? Is it the same thing that happened in Acts 11? Is it the same scenario? But it started from Acts 11. And it was not taken care of. Then after some time, it resurfaced. Good. So when salvation issues are not doctrinally taken care of, after some time again, they become an issue. Because the issue of salvation must be doctrinally settled. Why? It is major. And that's why the teaching of salvation cannot be overemphasized. The importance of making yourself available to be taught concerning the subject of salvation. Are you following? So now 
they said it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And to do what? To command them to keep the law of Moses. Question, who are these guys that are insisting that the people must be circumcised and they must keep the law of Moses? They are Pharisees that believed. Pharisees that believed. They were born again, but they still held onto their traditions. So a man can be born again, but still hold onto traditions of Moses in the church. Born again in the church, speaking in tongues, but still romancing the traditions of Moses. Are we in the house? These were Jewish people that were born again, but they were still holding onto the traditions of Moses. Their mindsets, their mindsets are not changed. And there are ministers on the pulpit today who are Pharisees. There are ministers on the pulpit today who are Pharisees. They are believers, but they still hold on to customs and practices of Moses. In Acts chapter 6 verse 7, we see a group there. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. See? But they never changed their mindset. They were believers, but they never changed their mindset. All right? So before getting born again, you see some people in the church, before getting born again, or when they were in religion, every time they dressed, they must wear a beret. You know beret. They must wear a beret. Because their Christianity is their beret. And they believe that if you don't wear beret, your salvation is not complete. Pharisees who believed. So they come to a church like Power City. With all the teaching we have taught, they are still wearing their beret. They are believers. But they are still holding on to the traditions of Moses. And these are people who have made the word of God of none effect. They are still wearing their beret. No matter what you say, there is something in their mind that is locked. That the liberty of Christ has not affected. Have you had some people say, why do people still wear trust in your church? Why do women wear trousers? I actually like women wearing trousers. I don't have a problem with that. Because trousers doesn't define a woman. Neither does rapper define a man. You know, we were in London just June, and then one of the days we were checking out of a hotel to another hotel, and these guys came with, a, with, with, with one of these old, old... Um, Antique cars, very expensive car, convertible. They drove the car to the front of a hotel. Obviously, they were going for a wedding. The guy came out. He was wearing a very beautiful tie, expensive shirt with a skirt. I had his picture on my phone. I couldn't let him escape. Quickly, I pulled out my phone. And I did like I was doing a phone call. I set the camera, then I gave him... I kept it so if you argue, I can show you that men wear skirts with a tie and that is complete dressing. And nobody stops them from coming to church. So why should somebody stop a woman from coming to church because she's wearing a trouser if men are wearing skirts? And it's a mindset. Pharisees. Believers who are still Pharisees. Believers who are still traditional in their minds. Whose minds have not allowed the liberty in Christ penetrate certain segments of their minds. Are we together here? And this boils down to salvation. There are some people, their salvation is in earring and necklace. And they are even in this church. You can never see them wear earring and necklace. Because that thing they taught them, that tradition of Moses has followed them even into the liberty in Christ. But they have not allowed themselves to be liberated. A sister is dressed with her ears, no earring, no necklace. Not because that's her dressing pattern. Religion gave that to her. 
and she's excited. She speaks in tongues. She's excited with us, but there is still captivity locked up somewhere in her belief system. This is what the law of Moses has done to so many people. This is what the law has done. They have not enjoyed the liberty in Christ. And this is what was happening in this church. Some people know scarf. They can never dress without putting a big scarf. No liberty. Even when their hair is long, they must still tie a scarf on top. It's like the woman who came to me for prayer. And then when she came to me for prayer, she was wearing no scarf. After telling me her problems, I told her to kneel down for prayer. Then I saw her running to go and get a scarf from her bag. I started praying. I just started immediately. I didn't wait for her. As soon as I said kneel down, she knelt down. Then I saw she touched her and she wanted to take off. I just said, Kimana Gabada. Thank you, my father. I decree. She ran halfway. She didn't know whether to go for the scarf or to come for the prayer. I kept praying. She ran back without the scarf and put her two hands on her head. Religion is wicked. Whom the son sets free is free indeed. So she ran and knelt down. Then I said to her, after prayer, I said, Madam, was that prayer answered? She said, powerful. It was answered. I said, so why are you running around? He said, it's my scarf. I, I said, but there is no scarf. Didn't God answer? She said, God answered. So if you know God answered, why that hypocrisy? The law makes you a hypocrite. Why that hypocrisy? Salvation is not in dressing. Salvation is not in airing and necklace. Salvation is not in an appearance. Salvation is in a person. Jesus is our sota. He is our sota. He is the sota who gave us sozo. He is the sota who gave us soteria. And he is the person of salvation. Glory to God. These were Pharisees. Were they not Pharisees? But they believed. But what made them Pharisees? The law of Moses. And so even though they believed the gospel, they still carried over the law of Moses. Watch carefully. They refuse to learn Christ. They are holding on to their traditions. They are not holding the head. They are holding tradition. So they suffer from kwashoko. Spiritual kwashoko. Because the diet they should hold on to. The hands they should have used to hold Christ. They are holding tradition. Are we still in the house? Pharisees preaching on the pulpit. And when you see their theology, it is mixed with practices of the law. Their theology is mixed. It's a mixture. So the question really was, when is salvation complete? That's where the issue is. Because they say, even though they are saved, they must command them to. In fact, look at it, verse 5. Verse 5 of that same chapter. But there arose up certain of the sect. I told you to underline that. The sect of the Pharisees which believed. Saying that it was needful. Take note of the strong words. To circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. To command them to keep the law of Moses. The word sect of the Pharisees that rose up. The word rose up there is used for raising children. To raise children. That means they grew in this. They grew in this, you know. They grew inside this mindset. You know, um, it's the Greek word exesima. Exesima. They grew into a denomination. That mindset. They grew with it into a denomination. And sometimes you hear somebody say, but that church is very big. It's a big denomination. They even have a TV and a radio. That doesn't mean what they are preaching is the truth. That doesn't mean what they are preaching is the truth. Satan has TV programs. Satan has radio. And Satan has crowd in thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions. That doesn't mean it's the truth. So that a crowd are in a place that they have a TV station and a radio station doesn't mean what they are preaching is Christ. Don't be gullible.
So there was a part of that church where the belief system had a problem. They were believers, born again, in fact, among the apostles, but they had a problem. So denominations, didn't start today. It started in the book of Acts. Denominations with error, with heresy. Because that was a sect. It was a denomination. But they were preaching a, a pseudo, a mixture. Believe Jesus, believe Moses. Believe Jesus, hold on to Moses. Don't leave Moses and follow Jesus. Eh, eh, carry the two. It was a denomination, a sect. Am I teaching here? Yeah, they were a sect. And that's the problem with many people. They will tell you, hey, I've been following Dr. Damina's teaching. He actually teaches nice. He teaches nice. But I also don't see anything wrong with our church. Then you find out what church are they going. First of all, since they've been in that church, they have never seen Christ. The first time they ever saw Jesus is when they started hearing my teaching. And yet they can, with, without shame in the afternoon, Without shame in the afternoon, they can actually deceive themselves by saying, I actually love Dr. Damina's teaching, but nothing is wrong with our church. And you've been there for 10 years, and you never knew Christ. Then even now, I doubt you have known Christ. A man that sees the light cannot come back and say darkness is better. Then he never saw the light. He never saw the light. When you truly see the light, nothing takes you back to darkness. And there are some people like that. Mm, Dr. Damina is teaching nice. But where do I start from? This church has been there all my life. All my friends are there. Everybody I know is in that church. Where do I start from? If I leave now, they will think I'm a rebel. You've not seen the light. You have not come to conviction. When people have conviction... They don't consider anybody else other than their conviction. You've not understood what we're preaching. When you understand what we're preaching, those considerations are irrelevant. Totally and absolutely irrelevant. Say, I hear you. Yes. Ah. You've been in that place. You've never known scripture. All the scripture you knew, you were wearing a veil as you were looking at them. Yet, after following me for one month, the veil left. Now you can defend that you are a Christian. And you say there's nothing wrong. I doubt if you have still understood what we're doing. Because when you really understand what we're doing, you will rise up and confidently say, I now know what is wrong. I know the difference between light and darkness. If you're hearing me in Power City, let me hear a powerful amen. amen. It's like somebody that has been in this church for two years and suddenly says, I don't like Power City. I want to go back to my former church. Guess where the former church was? Guess where? Eh? <laughs> One kind place like that. Where they give them assignment every week. How can I be in a church? No assignment. Since I came here, they have never said, go and bring sand from your village. They have never said, go and bring your grandmother's old cloth. They have never said, kill chicken and bring ten of the feather. They have never, how can I be in a church? You can see that that guy has a natural affinity with native doctorism. Is in his DNA, him and Nate, in fact, it won't be too long, he will become the coordinator of native doctors. Because if you can come into where light is, and you are still looking for chicken feather, what are you talking about? Stand fast in the liberty, wherewith Christ has set you free, and be not entangled with the yoke of bondage, for whom the Son sets free. Somebody's not shouting a powerful hallelujah. Uh -uh. They grew in the team. Faction. That word sect is the word faction. The Greek word heresies. Heresies. Same word for heresy. Heresy doesn't mean the person is not a believer. That a person is a heretic doesn't mean the person is not a believer. 
He's a heretic means he is a believer, but the traditions of Moses are still in his belief system. And he is trying to force it on believers. That's a heretic. Heresy. Look at it. I can show you a number of scriptures, the application of the word heresy. Acts 5.17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect, the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. So there was a sect in this particular place in Acts chapter 5. Acts 24, 5. For we have found this man, a pestilent fellow, and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. A ringleader. These are denominations. Acts 24, 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. This was brother Paul. They called him a heretic because he was teaching the truth. He says, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Acts 26, verse 5. We're dealing with the word sect or denominations. Which knew me from the beginning. If they will testify that after the most strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. I lived a Pharisee. It was a sect. Acts 28, 22. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Everywhere. This sect. In the epistles, 1 Corinthians eleven nineteen. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Brother Paul said, there must be also heresies. He's talking to the church at Corinth. He said, in this kind of church, there will be heresy. In fact, Brother Paul was very sure. Factions in Corinth. Heresies in Corinth. Diverse opinions. And today we celebrate people with opinions. You know, like the way we praise God in my former church, it's not the way they are praising God here. In fact, yeah, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. The songs are too slow and the songs are too dull. A man does not dance and sweat it out. <laughs> Uh, are you still in this house? And what songs were there in the former church? Bello, 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 bello. And see what the Lord can do. Hey! Bello, bello, bello. Bello, bello is the name of a man in the north. Bello, B-E-L-L-O. Why are you singing bello in the house of God? You're laughing. I know your mind is saying, it's not Bello, it's bend low. I know. But how does it sound? Bello. <laughs> Religion is wicked. Religion, very wicked. I went to a church in Port Harcourt, a church to preach some few years ago in Port Harcourt. And I got to this church to preach. I saw everybody wearing bathroom slippers. Yet they had beautiful cars parked outside. Beautiful, correct cars. Yet they were wearing bathroom slippers everywhere, dressed like some, 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 some chaff people they gathered from Somalia. So when I entered the church, uh -uh, me, I'm well dressed. I started feeling stupid for being overdressed. You know what I'm, I'm talking about? When you go into a party and you're the only one dressed and everybody's casual, you start looking for how to start removing some things. You remove the tie and losing the neck so that at least you can feel belonging. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so I started feeling stupid. So I called the host pastor and said, look, 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 what is all this thing? Why are your members looking like marketers? He said to me, I don't know. I don't know. And these are bankers, managing directors of companies. I said, you know. You know, how can you gather intellectual people and rubbish them like this? What have you been preaching? Is your message that is reflected? The pastor looked at me. I said, I'm not joking. I said, you will hear me this night. I will clean all this nonsense. By tomorrow, you will see a new church. Uh -uh. What are you talking about? It's the beauty of holiness, not the obglification of holiness. 
Are you following? <laughs> Tradition is wicked. These are empty. See the cars, powerful cars. Uh -uh. Then I entered. What I saw outside does not look like what I saw inside. There was a sharp departure. <laughs> then they now stood up to make matters worse. The church, they have not tied it. The church, the floors of the church is still dust. Then before they call me, the pastor now say, give us a hot chorus. Hot chorus. Let this house catch fire before this fireman of God will come up. So the people started, bello, 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 bello. Come and see all of them. MDs, general managers. See them, the whole place dust. People are coughing inside. Religion is as dirty as Satan. In fact, I had to turn my face because the dust was much. And they were swimming in it. Mindset. I came up to preach. I didn't, I refused to preach. I was teaching. Because if I preach, the dust will choke me. So let them sit down and hear me. By the time I finished with them, I said, you're slippers. I said, and I know you have powerful clothes. Tomorrow now you wear your nice clothes to work. Is God intimidated by your clothes? Ah, the next day come and see everybody. They dress like CEOs. Religion is wicked. It strips you of the beauty of Christ. It takes away from you dignity. It makes you a nobody. Religion. Religion. When the message of Christ is not well preached, even though people are saved, they will still be in bondage. Still be in bondage. And how many of you know heresy is a work of the flesh? Heresy is a work of the flesh. Heresy is a work of the flesh. And it means to have an opinion. An opinion. And nobody has a right to have an opinion outside of the scriptures. Nobody has that right. Galatians 5.20 Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies as a work of the flesh. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, damnable heresies. They create heresies, opinions, a sect in the church. You know, it's like some people just came up and said, anybody wearing jeans will go to hell. Have you had that teaching before? Yes. Anybody who wears jean trousers will go to hell. So they will put ushers to be checking people as they are coming. If you are wearing jeans, they set you aside. You cannot enter their church. That is a damnable heresy. What is that? A damnable heresy. It's heretic. When you attribute the finished work of Christ to a piece of cloth, to a piece of material. Amen. And some will say, if you don't pay your tight, things will be tight. That's heresy. And some people even took it to the extreme. If you don't pay your tight, you will go to hell. Uh-uh. And somebody asked me somewhere, do you believe in tight? I said, no, sir. Do you believe in tight? I said, no, I don't believe in tight. He said, why? I said, I believe in Jesus. There's no scripture that says you believe in tight. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I don't believe in tight. Is it clear? I don't believe in tight. Who do I believe in? Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I don't believe in tithe. I believe in Christ. And that's where some people get angry with me. They say, hey, Dr. Damira is telling people not to pay tithe. He's telling people not to give at all. How will we sponsor the things of God? You have not listened to me. You have itching ears. Tithe is not giving. Tithe is not giving. Tight is tax. It's a taxation system. That's why they say pay. In giving, we don't pay. 
Because giving has to do with generosity. What you pay is, it, it means you are owing. But where Christ is concerned, we owe him nothing. What he did for us was not for us to pay. It's called grace. It's called grace. What Christ has done for us is grace. Are we in the house? I was watching one woman preaching today in one of those churches in Lagos. He said, and now you hear people are going around saying, and not, that's exactly what I was thinking. And now you go around hearing people are going around saying, Christ has paid it all. Christ has paid it all. You don't need to do anything. My brother, there is generational cause in your family. Even though Christ has paid it all, you still have a part to play. That is Christ plus for salvation. She was busy. Blowing like fire. And I know it's us she's referring to. Us. You know us? Us. <laughs> they are going everywhere. It's a sect. A sect of the Pharisees who are also believers. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They're also believers. But in their minds, their minds are still locked up with the law of Moses. And there are people like that even in this church. Who are still having that thing? They are not here. Eh? Okay. Pastor Praise has intervened for the church. But may I catch you? <laughs> what are you talking about? Okay, you say they are not here. Okay, let me leave. <laughs> Is their opinion? To say if you don't pay tithe, you will go to hell. It's a personal opinion. It's not a doctrinal teaching. That makes that group of people a sect. A sect. A group with an opinion that is not scripture. Heresies. It's a self-chosen opinion. That's the meaning of the word heresy. A self-chosen opinion. And that word heresies... Is taken from the word heriomi. It means personal. And it's used for strong views. A personal strong view. And the people who bring these heresies into the church, they are very strong about it. They will bring it out of a verse of the Bible that does not have solid exegesis. Just a verse. Then they will carry that verse and stretch it beyond the call of duty. And they will conclude on that verse without any other contextual exegesis on the verse. They won't even read the verses before. They will not read the verses after. They just take, in fact, sometimes it may be a sentence in a verse. A sentence. And that's why they hate contextual teaching like we do. Because once we show up, light has come. Once we show up, light has come. We now dismantle what they have done and bring exegesis. And suddenly, what it meant is not what was said. I don't know if you understand it. Yeah. That's why sound Bible teaching has no alternative. And that's why a pastor must get involved. With thorough teaching of scripture. Hallelujah. And sometimes this kind of issues cause division in the church. It causes division. And somebody said to me, Dr. Damina, you are the ones causing division. I said, no, you're wrong. We are not causing division. We are teaching the Bible. It's you people that has no scripture to back what you claim that are causing division. Because everything we have said. We gave overwhelming scriptural evidence with contextual interpretation of the text. Is that true? So we are not the ones causing, it's they that have abused the scriptures and have taught the scriptures out of context that are causing confusion to the body of Christ. Not we. Strong opinion. First on the gospel. Strong opinion. You hear them say, when praises go up, blessings is fraud. 
is fraud. No praise is praise enough to bring a blessing down. No praise is praise enough. If you like praise in mud and bring blood out of your body, it cannot bring down any blessing. No praise can bring any blessing down. None. Why do we praise? We praise to reinforce, to reinforce what we believe in the scriptures in our understanding. That's why what we sing must agree with what we are taught. Yeah. Are you hearing me now? Yes. No blessing came because you praised. Blessings came before praise went anywhere. Glory to God. Am I dealing with something here tonight? Maybe it's God's dealing with a man. Forget it. These are factions on the issue of salvation. Factions. Peter called them damnable heresies or destructive heresies. And he called them false teachers. A false teacher is somebody that should not be teaching. And he says, these heresies, they bring them in privately, secretly. You know, secretly is a Greek word, parasego. They will add secretly in their teaching. You understand? They will sandwich it inside their teaching. They will sandwich it somewhere. They are teaching and teaching and teaching. Then subtly, they will push it inside. Push it inside. Say, you are a sister. And you say you believe that Jesus paid it all. And you say you believe that you are bought with a price. And yet you are putting makeup on your fingers. Are you saying, God, you didn't do a perfect job? Examine yourself. <laughs> now, they are teaching that Jesus bought you with a price. But they have added something. Subtly, very subtly. They won't push it. Eh? It will just, they will casually drop it. And leave it to torment you. Until you use razor blade to clean. Is it makeup? What is that thing? Is it cortex? Cutex? Nail polish. Okay, what of the one that has red, green, blue? It's all nail polish. I've gone to school today. I learn every day. So they will now tell you. Then you see sisters carrying quickly. They are carrying. Their... Father, I'm sorry for adding to what you have created. Why don't you remove your cloth? Is your cloth not an addition? Remove all your cloth and walk naked because by wearing cloth, you're adding to what God has created. Be the way you were born. See your face. Naked came I, naked shall I go. <laughs> if we will not send ushers to carry you quickly, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be in the toilet locked up till they go and look for cloth to cover you. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <laughs> That word deliver us from evil is deliver us from the evil one. From the evil one. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. So these people, when they teach, they will use subtlety to push in some of these things. And that's why when you are grounded in knowledge, you are sharp. You know what I'm talking about? You're almost like a critic, but you're not a critic. It's just that you're very sharp. You're discerning. Fim, 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 fim. As the thing is coming, you're sifting. <laughs> Uh, this one, okay, okay, yes, uh, psh, no, no, uh, mm -hmm, bring this, uh, psh, psh, mm, yeah, yeah, okay, yes, yes, uh, mm, mm, psh, stop first, mm -mm, stay here, I will think about you after service, next, <laughs> you're sifting, why, because your discernment is sharp, why, because doctrine has been established in you, nothing goes anymore, your salvation has become established, so nobody can razzmatazz you, somebody shout, I hear you, if you're getting blessed tonight, shout, I hear, I hear. Shall bring in damnable heresies. Like the guy who wrote a book on deliverance. The book is deliverance. You understand? Uh, the book is titled Deliverance. And he opened the book with Colossians 1.13. Great. Who hath delivered us. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Alright, then in our says, even though we know it is true, but even though we know it is true, 
But some of you are coming from families where the girls find it difficult to get married. Some of you, you don't define me by circumstances. You define me by Christ. The believer is not defined by events. Uh -uh. He is defined. That's why the revelation of Jesus unveils the identity of the believer. Jesus is my reality. What is not in him is not in me. What he cannot do, I cannot do. Why? When I see him in him, I see who I am. Irrespective of what is happening around me. So when I occupy his office in authority, I subdue circumstances. I subdue situations. I'm teaching good here. Casting down imagination. Bringing down every thought under subjection to obey Christ. Why will you bring it down? Because it will contradict who you are. These things will contradict your identity. They will contradict your personality. They will attack you. They will attack your position. They will attack your possession in Christ. So that's why it's, it's warfare. Because now your job is to maintain what Christ has obtained by holding fast the profession of your faith and resisting the devil steadfastly where? In the faith. That's why it's called warfare. That's why you're equipped. That's why you're equipped. So when things are beginning to look contrary to who you are, what do you do? You take authority. Somebody say, I take authority. Kabayada. Say, Jesus' authority is my authority. His name is my name. His office is my office. What he cannot tolerate, I cannot tolerate. I'm completing him. Shout glory somebody. Glory. And so when the devil rub your head with sickness, you say no, it can't operate here. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. Get out of my life. Father, I receive wisdom. I receive wisdom to eat the right food and drink the right water and observe the right lifestyle to get rid of this symptom from my body. Because after you speak, you need wisdom to know what to eat. You need wisdom to know when to sleep. You need wisdom to know what to do to knock off the symptoms. And you receive that by faith because it's yours in Christ. If I'm teaching, say I hear you. It's not just sickness go. After it goes, you must know what to do. Jesus prayed for Peter's mother-in-law. After he finished praying for her, this is Jesus who is God. He said, give her food to eat quickly. Give her food. Why should she eat food? Because food is needed to sustain the healing. That's what it's called supernatural. So it's a combination of super plus natural. Teaching good? A combination of what? The super plus the natural. Prayer plus food. Not just prayer. And not just food. The right food. There's food you can eat and have bad dream. There's food you can eat and they press you and slap you. It's nobody slapping you. It's the weight of the food landing you a slap. May God give you understanding. Are you getting blessed? We are still dealing with salvation. <laughs> There's food you eat. <laughs> Lizards will be flying all over the house. It's what you eat. Say, so I will bless your bread and I will bless your water. Very important. Amen. You, you, you mind what you eat. You mind what you eat. Food is so important to the human body. So important. That's where the body came from is where the food is coming from. My yeah, mama has been dealing with this in the last few days. The body came from the dust. So what will sustain the body comes from the dust. The, the solution that takes care of the human body is grown from the ground because both the body and that thing came from the same source. May God give you understanding. Stop eating anyhow. Eat a mala, eat a book, eat a bar the same day. And then you want to be normal. <laughs> Even the names, don't you see they are not normal names? A bar, a book, uh, and a bar. Talia. Everything is boom, 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 boom. 
you stand there, you say good morning. You say, what's good about the morning? Of course, there's nothing good about the morning, even the things you ate. <laughs> Glory to God. If you're getting blessed, you're blessed. I just saw some people's problem in the last few minutes. Glory to God. That's heresy. To say bot. You're teaching, teaching. Then you add one bot. is heresy. Somebody shout, I am who the word says I am. The Bible calls it destructive heresies. It means heresies that brings a man down. Now look at that Acts 15 verse 5. But there arose up starting of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. The word needful is the Greek word died. It means you must or something that is inevitable. Needful. Somebody said to me, are you against people confessing their sins? No, I'm not against people confessing their sins. But you must also know that confessing your sin does not bring forgiveness. Case closed. If you like, you can confess your sin. If it makes you feel better. But you must know that it does not bring forgiveness. Forgiveness is the work of Christ. So are you against people paying tithe? In fact, I would rather that people should pay tithe than that they are stingy. I would rather that somebody should pay tithe than that he is stingy to the work of God. But I don't teach tithing. I teach generosity. I teach liberality. I teach giving generously because that's the message in all of the epistles. And I'm a New Testament minister. What if somebody choose to give 10%? Fine, it's his money. It's his money. If that's the one you choose to give, fine. Just like somebody would choose to give 50 and somebody would choose to give 25. It's generosity. As a man has proposed in his heart, so... So if it's 10% he proposed, shouldn't he give? Exactly. Exactly. But it becomes heresy when you now bring that opinion and make it compulsory. They must be circumcised. They must keep the law of Moses. That's what makes it a heresy. Somebody shout, I hear you. Yeah. Now, that word die is a command or a charge. A command or a charge. Now, look at it. He says, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed saying. The word saying is a very strong word. It's perajelo. It means warning the people. Warning or threatening them to keep the law. Threatening them. The word saying means to threaten. You should threaten them to keep the law. Parajelo. Jesus used it in Matthew 10.5. The twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Saying, that is warning them. Acts 1, 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. The same word. Look at it again in Acts 4, 18. And they called them and commanded them. The same word, Paragelo. Commanded them. Acts 5, 28. Saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. He says, straightly command you. Straightly command you. Authoritative speaking. Look at it again. Used in Acts chapter 5 verse 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. They commanded. Acts 16, 18. And Acts 16, 23 for your personal study. And Acts chapter 10 verse 42. So they were warning the people to keep the law of Moses. They were warning them, threatening them. Even though you believe in Jesus, you must circumcise yourself for your salvation to be complete. 
Even though you believe in Jesus, you must keep the law of Moses. If not, your salvation is not complete. That's why it's heresy. They made it a condition for salvation. Are you following? Heresy can be a strong opinion or a strong teaching or a prevailing teaching in an assembly. A strong opinion, a strong teaching, a prevailing teaching in an assembly or a place. Now, there's another word there quickly. is the word to keep the law. To keep. To keep is the Greek word terio. It means to observe it. Something you keep looking at. To keep the law of Moses means they have to keep looking at the law. And who are they teaching to keep looking at the law? Believers. They were teaching believers. The issue, you know, in that book of Acts was not whether the Gentiles should be saved. It was the fact that the Gentiles can be saved, but their salvation will only be complete if they are circumcised and if they keep the law of Moses. That was the heresy. That Jesus is not enough to save. You must add some things. You must add some things. Amen? And there are many ministries who are emphasizing it. Believing is not enough for salvation. Don't think that just because I believe, I believe you are saved. Heaven is very far. <laughs> I believe, I believe. But many of you saw in the last few days, we read through the entire book. It's all believe, believe, believe. Did you observe all through the entire book? It's believe, believe, believe. But they were emphasizing to observe the law. Brother Paul calls it another gospel. Enterius. Another gospel. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that has called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another. But there will be some that will trouble you. There will be some who will trouble you. Who will pervert the gospel of Christ. But if I or an angel from heaven preach any other thing to you than that which you have preached, let him be an anathema. They may mention Jesus in that they are teaching, but it's not the same Jesus. So that's where the gullible people are caught. He said, but they, are, they, they pray in Jesus' name, and they mention Jesus all the time, that they are mentioning Jesus is not the same Jesus. Brother Paul in Corinthians says, there is another Jesus. There is another gospel and there is another spirit. So when you hear Jesus, ask which one? Which one? But what establishes which one is the doctrine, the content of the message, not the label on the container. Not the label on the container, but the content in the container. So that they are using Jesus is not enough. We have to find out what is the gist of the teaching. If the teaching is not around Christ, then it's just a label branding another gospel. It's a label branding another gospel. And that's why it's up to. And that's why I'm taking time to teach you all of these details. So that when you are detailed and grounded, it doesn't matter the trick the man is using. You know what to look for. And if that thing is not there, you know that this guy is a trickster. Am I teaching here? Yeah. Another gospel. Which is not a go another. But there will be some that trouble you. Any teaching that is not Christ is trouble. They are just troubling your soul. They are just troubling your soul. Any teaching that is not Christ is trouble. It will unsettle you. It will make you unsure of your salvation. Any teaching that takes away from you the assurance of your relationship with Christ is antichrist. Any teaching that makes you start doubting whether you will go to heaven or not. Things like heaven at last is a thief. That statement is a thief of the believer's assurance in Christ. Heaven at last. Somebody told me on phone, my prayer for you is that after all this thing you're doing, you will make heaven. I caught the lie. Pop! Pop! And I was waiting. If another call had come, I would have pressed block. Leave that matter. Me, you are praying for me. Or me, I should pray for you. Have you ever seen darkness praying for light? Oh, yeah. 
There are some people you should be afraid to tell them, let me pray for you. Do you understand? Eh? Huh? Somebody has more light than you. You want to pray for him. Who should pray for who? It's a question. Have you ever seen darkness praying for light? Uh -uh. Can't we pray for a man of God? You pray for him in your house. The God that sees you in secret. <laughs> you pray for me in your house. After all, brother Paul said, brethren, but don't come to me and say, Papa, close your eyes, let me pray for you. Uh, me and you, who is pastor? You don't get respect. I'm your pastor. And you honor me. Amen. Amen. Except if I kneel down and say, please, everybody pray for me. Stretch your hands. Then you pray for me at my request. And when you have that opportunity, pray with all your life. Yeah. Father, Papa, Ianaga, Ianaga. Because he may not get another one very soon. <laughs> Glory! Yeah. But I pray for you all the time. It is my responsibility to do that. Is that not true? No, it's my responsibility. And it's yours to also pray for me. Amen. I said amen. These guys were reasoning that no, your salvation is not complete until you keep the law of Moses. Are you circumcised? Okay, even if you are circumcised, which day were you circumcised? If it's not the eighth day, you have to go back for another one. Uh -uh. Circumcision for gospel? No. We are the circumcision that worship God we are. Exactly. Our circumcision is spiritual. The day you got born again, new birth, the sword of God's word is called the sword of the spirit. As I'm preaching right now, you're receiving the sword of the spirit. Those that are not born again, as the message comes, it comes like a sword and it goes into their spirit. Bam! And creates regeneration. It's called faith. And from that day, you bear in your body the mark of Christ. From that day, you're born of God. See, I hear you. And from that day, you're circumcised. The, the old man is removed. And the new man emerges. Being born again. Not of corruptible seed. But of incorruptible seed by the word of God. Are you enjoying yourself tonight? Well, stand on your feet. Let me close this up. Glory to God. Woo! Somebody born of God, lift your right hand and shout, I am born of God. My salvation is complete. I have an unconditional salvation by faith in the work of Christ. All the conditions have been fulfilled by Christ. I believe, I receive. I didn't hear your amen. He said, what the Lord could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of God may be fulfilled in us. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Jesus fulfilled the demands. And we are recipients of the finished work of Christ. Our job is to lambano what Christ has done. Somebody shout, I lambano my inheritance in Christ Jesus. Total inheritance. Complete inheritance. Nothing missing. Nothing lacking. Nothing broken. I thought I would hear a powerful amen. Lift your right hand, Father. I pray for everybody in this building. I command where mindsets were messed up before now. By the entrance of your word, I command those mindsets liberated. 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 In the name of Jesus. And I declare that the liberty that we have in Christ, it's already yours in Christ Jesus. So enjoy that liberty. Walk in that liberty. Live in that liberty. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. Oh, we give you praise. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that, Amen, on a note of finality. Lift your right hand and shout, I stand fast. In the liberty. We are with. Christ has set me free. I will no more be entangled with the yoke of bondage. I am free. Free. 
Free. Free indeed. Amen. And somebody says, are you saying that women cannot wear her tie if they want, but not as a condition for salvation? If you want to wear her tie, it is part of the cloth you're wearing. Wear it well. In fact, especially those tall ones that look like a tower. Wear it and look dignified. Nothing is wrong with that. But not as a prerequisite for salvation. But as a prerequisite for fashion. Just like I can wear a knicker to church with t-shirt. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't. But because of you, I will not wear it. Is it not true? Because of you. I won't wear a nika. Because it is not an official way of dressing in this culture. So I won't wear it. But I can wear it. Amen. So that brothers will not go and start plating their hair. I'm plating my hair. Papa, say any how you like it. It's your, if you plate your hair, I will lay hands on you. Because you're not understanding what I'm saying. It's not rascalism. We have liberty. But in our liberty, we serve one another. See, I hear you. We do not allow our liberty become a stumbling block for the weak. See, I hear. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you well. So you don't come to church half naked. And say, after all, Papa, say, anyhow, Christ has set us free. You wear a skirt that, <laughs> even, uh, even Satan will say, how about, pull it down small. Pull it down small. Even me, Satan, I am not comfortable. <laughs> Bring it down. <laughs> attachment, attachment. <laughs> short skirt, no short skirt, you are saved. It doesn't affect salvation. But we are brethren. And so what we do, we must consider one another because we love the brethren. Christ laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our life for our brethren. So I deprive myself for my brother's comfort. Is it clear? If it's clear, say I hear. Uh -huh. I declare over this. You are blessed. Uh -huh. It's too late. I say amen or not, it's too late. You're already blessed. <laughs> I say you are blessed. I tell your neighbor, it's too late now. I can't be cursed. I'm already blessed. Irreversible blessing. My blessing is a person. His name is Christ. He's inside me. Amen. Glory. Oh! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service. What a time of learning. A time of unlearning and a time of relearning the word of his grace. Brother Paul says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you your inheritance among the sanctified. The word has come with clarity. Please don't go away. If there's anything that was wrong in your life, the word of God has gone forth to fix it. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke pain. I rebuke confusion. I rebuke discomfort. Now, receive healing. Receive a miracle where you need one today. In the name of Jesus, receive a miracle. I clear every confusion out of your life. We rebuke fear and the hold of darkness is broken in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I'm excited. Now listen very carefully. I want to encourage you. I have a lot of books like you can see them displayed on the screen. All of these are resources written painstakingly to equip you Answer your questions and bring you clarity of explanation of the word of God. Shoot email to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll respond to you properly and give you all the information you require to acquire these books. You can order them from our office, either the books, the CDs, or the DVDs. Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Shoot us a mail today with your orders and we will ensure that we reach out to you today. If you're in a city where there's no church where the message of christ like this is preached or taught that is already an opportunity for you to serve jesus by getting involved with ministry this is the way it works all you need to do is shoot us a mail we will take time and equip you and prepare you to begin an extension of our church ministry called a campus 
where other believers in your locality can assemble with you in your own venue and learn together with you the message, pray with you, and together all of you can reach out to more people with the truth of the gospel. Or you're in a place where you desire to just belong to the campus, shoot us a mail with your location today. We'll connect you to the nearest campus to where you are of our ministry. It's always a joy to serve you the grace of God. Always a joy to bring you clarity, to equip you, to build you up in the knowledge of Christ. I'm excited today, looking forward to hearing from every one of you today. And don't forget to stay tuned for the next broadcast that comes up in a few hours from now. Share with people about what God is doing on this platform. And until we connect with you again, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Amen.